Minute by minute, I mean, geopolitics could blow resistance levels out of the water. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault and from the entire Live from the Vault team worldwide. Welcome. We really appreciate you, as you can imagine. The Life in the Vault community keeps growing and we thank you for your continued support. My name is Shane Morand and I'll be the host for this exciting episode of Live from the Vault. There's a lot to talk about during these historic times and Andrew McGuire is in the house and he'll be talking gold, giving you access to information and an inside scoop that you just can't get anywhere else. So just fasten your seatbelt because this episode is no exception. So just before we get to Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire, remember, please keep spreading the news and the word about this exciting channel by hitting that like button, sharing this information, smash the subscribe button, and then you can click on that bell notification if you'd like to be notified as each episode goes live. So I would recommend you do it not now, but do it right now. Go ahead and click that button. So with that, let's head over to the UK and Talking Gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Can we pick up the thread on this, especially as we also have fresh geopolitical drivers? Shane, great to be with you again, my friend. Um, yeah, let, let's, let's start there. That's always a, a good place to start. Um, though even before today's and look, today we're recording this on Thursday. Uh, geopolitics kicked off. They had a Russia incursion overnight. Crazy markets, obviously. But even before, and I think you know it's important because let's let's, let's drill down into where we are, what, where we're going, all this kind of stuff. But even before today's major geopolitical escalation, uh, we'd already evidenced five consecutive spot gold fixes. That settled just below and, and, and just above 1900. Even yesterday, it was over 1900. Um, and in fact, uh, 1900, then 1904. And today, uh, and which happened there, I didn't check where we fixed, but probably about 1930. Uh, uh, and because uh, we've just fixed it a second ago. And the last, um, look, the, this, this really started the first sort of fixes that moved above the old range started really a week ago on the 17th. It's th Thursday the 17th. Here we are Thursday again. Uh, and this was well before. It's important to say this is well before the geopolitical escalations impacted gold. Now, into this rise in gold prices, we've evidenced both physical demand and ETF inflows. And you know what we think about these ETF inflows. We'll look at that as well. Now, the physical demand element is notable as it's consistently evidenced the sovereign institutional size buyer that we've reported that's been very active since December the 15th, which is he's been appearing, they've been appearing at every single PM Gold fix without exception since then. Now, we, we suspected, I mean, remember, we've discussed this before, but we suspected it was Russia and China. But if you recall, we also reported a first year RBMA bank squaring off all their unallocated gold contracts, which given we had concluded our clients' trans transactions now, actually I can now reveal it was Goldman Sachs, who are undoubtedly facilitating supplying to sovereign buyers as well. Now, you know, very, if, if anyone knows what's going on, Goldman knows what's going on. In fact, look, it's no coincidence that Goldman was out on Bloomberg early this morning uh, saying gold uh, came into this year undervalued. I mean, coincidence timing? I don't know. And 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 they're talking about it has great upside potential. And the interview came through even as gold crossed 1950 bucks. Now, these sovereign buyers have not just been taking advantage of discounts since the December since December the 15th of last year but also buying into price rises, which is important. It's not just waiting for a discount. Now, and that culminated uh, in yesterday's fix before uh, Russia's incursion, and it fixed yesterday at 1904.70 before this incursion. And what was notable was that our liquidity providers said it was in very large size at this level. Now, clearly, 
Somebody knew what was going on. And since then, geopolitics have been the drivers evidencing a risk on, risk off churn based upon really hourly, daily, even minute by minute news flows. And this is going to continue for a while. Now, recent liquidity provider confirmations of sovereign size demand uh, being present really also jives with our first hand information that we reported live here on uh, uh, on, on, on Life from the Vault, that a first tier LBMA market maker bank, which is now revealed as Goldman Sachs, had moved Basel III compliant after squaring off all their unallocated gold market credit risk. Now, while we cannot possibly confirm that the remaining first tier market making LBMA banks who are privileged to have gold accounts with the Bank of England, which are directly related to the BIS, of course. We can't confirm they've done the same, but it's very, very likely that by now they've become NSFR compliant. And we know firsthand that the second tier Swiss banks and trading desks we deal with had moved to adopt these NSFR standards shortly after the March 2020 EFP blow up. And if you remember, we reported it at the time. Now, this has been a frustratingly long process, but it is underway. And Shane, as you know, our focus has been on the fickle, rinsable paper element of the current geopolitically motivated safe haven price ramp. So while this paper gold element has historically been very easy to flush out, the longer term, the longer that the paper price holds above old prior technical resistances, the more technical damage is done and it resets where the physical market will be able to underpin any sudden de-escalation dips and which is when hot money dumps all their safe havens, race back into chasing bubble territory risk, of course, um, underpinned now by a wavering and very questionable Fed, actually, and especially this Fed put that's been in place. Uh, really, the Fed is boxed here. I mean... To be honest, this is going to cause what's happening today is really going to accelerate uh, really inflation enormously. Commodity inflation is going to go through the roof. So, you know, they're really, are the rate hikes going to start and go from seven down to three, down to two? We don't know. Are we looking at rate cuts? We don't know at this point because I don't think the Fed knows. Now, given that the COMEX centric ETFs, which is GLD and SLV, you know, we've been focusing on it. They don't like the fact we're focusing on it, but we sure as hell are. We clearly know that these inflows are not yet Basel III compliant. Uh, and, and with both of these opaque uh, flywheels churning unallocated gold and silver spot credit positions to the degree they cannot be considered to represent physical metal. Now, obviously, we've discussed how they do not assist. These ETF flows don't assist in discovering a real supply demand price. Furthermore, these COMEX related exchangeable positions are also subject to this hot money volatility. Now, real physical, once it's allocated and vaulted, tends to be very, very sticky. And it's not subject to, to really uh, hot money volatility at all, thereby discovering and underpinning a solid physical supply demand price. Now, by weighing up the two separate markets, which is really what we try and do every, every episode, one is diluting the price, the other, the other side is discovering it. And so by doing that, we can determine the dollar price level where Western central banks dare not push the price. Uh, and that's really because all that's doing is a reopening the carefully managed hidden gold window. And the very same Bretton Woods window Nixon sought to close over 50 years ago. And what really is missed by most commentators is that Basel III is seeking to close this window, currently being competitively exploited by competing central banks and sovereigns who are busy exchanging their rapidly depacing dollars for physical gold, as if really what we're saying, this, this window is wide open. And but by backing FX gold, foreign exchange gold with physical, uh, paper market dilution will evaporate. And we see the BIS positioning for higher gold prices. Yes, Andy, as you say, there comes a point where the BIS will need higher gold prices. What are you seeing in the market right now? Shane, really good question. 
and this is what we're seeing right now from a wholesale market perspective, it's so important. Putting geopolitics aside, uh, it, it's this simple. Physical demand for gold for immediate delivery is overwhelming the ability to even forward purchase gold without attracting a very large premium. Now, the spot forward price allows one to spot index a number of ounces at the quoted spot price like we just saw today. However, securing size comes with an increasingly large bilaterally settled premium to that price. Now, the larger the order, the higher the premium. So when exchanging gold for silver foreign exchange credit positions for physical for immediate, which we call T plus zero delivery or T plus two is acceptable as a d delivery, it's quite different for gold into an increasingly Basel Reef compliant NSFI environment versus silver and silver. But silver and all commodities will also have to adopt NSFRs uh, soon because it's really still a still a, a pro it is creating a problem uh, on their balance sheet. Now, looking at gold, unlike silver, which at the margin has an industrial component that does not need to be hedged, actually, uh, the industrial component doesn't need to be. Uh, it's going to be used. Um, gold has a known annual refiner production capacity. So based upon supply demand, physical gold is either hoarded, hedged, or divested, really largely based upon the daily pressures, uh, the, the da daily PM fix price, which we just saw a little while ago. Now, from the perspective of a sovereign central bank or indeed a wholesaler, when acting for a client to purchase large size, large physical gold, we initially purchase a long FX gold XAU position against the dollar leg in the very liquid uh, multi-trillion dollar you over the counter market. Now, locking in a price for a number of ounces, kilos or tons at any point during an active session. It doesn't have to wait for a PM fix. However, at this stage, all this has done is lock in and spot index the price of foreign exchange cash gold against the dollar or the euro, etc., etc., for this amount of gold credit. This is that's the point, that's all that's happened at this point. Now, out of the hundreds of tons of gold credit positions netted out and cleared each day amongst the LBMA member bank's books, it's only when standing for delivery that the gold credit position is crystallized into physical metal for a certain delivery time frame at really varying pre premiums above spot that you can negotiate. Now, for example, if after locking in a price, uh, a client wants to obtain delivery of a spot indexed long gold short dollar credit risk as soon as possible they want to divest this and uh, this risk as soon as possible uh, and and secure the physical um, versus agreeing out a far a much further delivery time frame which may allow for a forward purchase to be married with a future supply so at obviously in other words at a lesser price then obviously a bilaterally settled physical price must be agreed with a refiner, producer, or a bullion bank, right? So it's, I mean, it's straightforward. However, the LBMA bullion banks act as a cartel. Now, we've talked about this before, and if one seeks large size and you shop around to fill several smaller tranches for immediate delivery, kind of under the radar, even if you're offering a large premium, the cartel will close rank and you actually risk being red flagged. Look, all metals credit lines at producers and refiners are ultimately provided by the banking cabal. So they can very quickly discover who the buyer is and uh, then one risks being completely blacklisted and cut off from future supply. Now, this is particularly evident in silver where we have run into this issue and we've reported this in the past where we've run into issues with dealings with the LBMA and COMEX market maker Standard Chartered and UBS. They have far-reaching tentacles. Well, that's an interesting way to put it, Andrew. And just before we started this episode, you talked about how you can walk us through exactly how you approach buying gold and silver into such a manipulated uh, market. Can you maybe step us through? I think it'd be really helpful uh, if you walked our subscribers and our viewers through this process as it explains a lot about uh, how we're building higher physical support in, in a stair-step approach. Okay, to illustrate, to illustrate 
Credit risk aside, look, if we've purchased a long FX uh, gold position of any size, let's just say at 1900 an ounce today, now, it, it, it really doesn't matter if the price rises to 2500 as we have locked in that spot gold price at 1900 and we couldn't care less how much the price rises because we have we already own that credit position. However, the bank on the other side of this trade owns a short gold position at 1900. So if we rep represent a client who is sticky and he can't be shaken out or incentivized to take a paper profit at any point, the bank must then square the position and stump up the physical at some point. Now, if agreeing a longer term delivery time frame to keep premiums tight, then the, the trade can be cleared off the books of the supplying bank at a reason, reasonably negotiated premium. Now, this provides the bank and liquidity provider time to either forward buy and hedge this position themselves or, or bet against the price rising in the hope that they can supply it at a cheaper price than 1900. And they would then pocket the difference. And this is where Basel III impacts that trade because that is the age old game. But Basel III is changing that. And historically, liquidity providers were not subject to Basel III NSFR standards. Whereas since the 1st of January, all LBMA banks have had to comply, to which end this increasingly limits their collusive leasing or naked short selling activities. However, as we've recently drawn attention to the LBMA market making bank, Bullion Banks Cartel, is clearly still not Basel III compliant when they flywheel unallocated gold as an as yet unbacked EFP gold credit position into and out of the GLD ETF, the, the ETF, which is directly related to the COMEX. So even if it throws through an EFP position, it is still, when it's converted to spot, it's just a credit, as we've just described, it's just still a gold credit position. Now, footprints suggest this is where the existing BIS swaps are being churned until they are squared. So, so that answers a lot of questions about the BIS uh, position. And we, because we know the BIS wants to revalue gold at some point. And as we discussed in our last episode, the wrench in the GLD flywheel is that this current price capping flywheel increasingly runs into a deliverable physical LBMA fixed price, which is coming under attack into an increasingly tight for supply physical market at current prices. So the non-conversion of a long unallocated gold credit position are now limited to what percentage that these exchange for physical inflows can be rinsed in and out of GLD before they are actually converted it to physical. So the portion that comes into physical, they can't touch. It has to be backed. But the portion that's going into the uh, GLD can. And that's what, so that's what we're saying. That, that's where the game currently is. And it's been reduced to that. Now, in the very, very short term, this structurally bullish development, it really flies under the radar of the COMEX-centric specs who, unlike the, the commercial market makers, are blinkered to the effect uh, that Basel III NSFRs are having on the long over-the-counter spot foreign exchange gold contracts that back up COMEX short hedges. In other words, these over-the-counter longs are increasingly physically deliverable, which in turn ultimately makes this exchange for physical uh, flywheel deliverable other than the part that goes into GLD. So this is the point we're trying to draw attention to. So Basel III NSFRs were implemented to obviously protect liquidity buyers, banks from being exposed to another March 2020 like EFP event. Now that's an event that came close to bringing down the entire daisy chain of LBMA banks. And this to be avert, for this to be averted again, the COMEX to spot exchange for physical price must begin to align with real physical supply demand metrics. Backwardations, and we've discussed this, this is where the futures price is actually lower than the cash price. It indicates it's not the case. We're constantly seeing this situation. And right now, the ETFs are the only paper flywheel keeping the, the, the EFPs, the exchange for physical balance, and I put that in inverted brackets here, into backwardated futures to spot positions. 
And this is happening just as refiners are tight for supply. Andrew, you mentioned geopolitics and its effect on the gold market. Can you kind of go into a little bit more detail on this? Yeah, geopolitical events have driven a lot of fresh safe haven money into gold. Now, this is important because there's a paper element to these flows that are rinsable. And, and you can see that here today. You can see there's a paper element. Now, as we discussed last time, COMEX generated inflows into GLD will not be helpful as they can be flywheel to try and cap the heavily defended 1900 level into BIS options expiring next Monday, next week. But we also evidence a very strong safe haven physical demand, which given it is reported in sovereign size, will assist in underpinning this, um, the lack of conversions that we've talked about of, of unallocated gold into physical, into the GLD inflows, which is just this flywheel, nothing happens. So while the paper uh, to, to physical reset plays out, a higher stair step nevertheless is being cemented above prior resistances, which were between 1850 and 1880. Now, huh, you know, that, that is, that, that, there's some options bets here, which are really off center. Now, it's happened in March 2020, and it can happen again. Now, if, if the current escalation continues, then the physical market will have a chance to catch up to the 1900s. Now, it's early to say that right now, because we've only had it, th this blow th higher today. That's, but this will severely roil these bearish options bets, which have been capping 1900 for some time. And today we've evidenced large scale Delta hedge futures buying, which is when you see an, when if you bet a, a position, say in the options market, against the 1900 being uh, be, be, being achieved or being breached, then obviously you've bet against that. Now, if you suddenly find that your position is is now going in the hole because you're going above 1900, what you have to do is buy futures to hedge that position or close the damn thing down. So we're seeing a lot of that, um, um, this kind of buying to mitigate this sh huge short squeeze, which clearly weren't bet when these original bets were placed probably up to a year ago. Now, if these shorts capitulate, then a very large rally is going to ensue. So, you know, we've, we've got immediate refiner constraints for gold, really have tightened up supply into central bank, safe haven physical demand. It's important to keep in mind that the paper to physical exchange for physical operate at the margin. And it only takes a small reduction of underlying physical supply into an increasingly Basel III compliant over the counter market to force long standing options bets to be short covered or delta hedged, forcing the price to rise. Now, this is exactly the churn that we are evidencing under the covers of the smoke and mirrors COMEX centric paper market action. So if we're looking at the current option structure, because obviously we've got that expiry next Monday. So obviously, what, what do we look, want to look at? And as we head into uh, Monday the 28th, we see the gold old, the old fight line at 1850 decimated. And while we expect a fight into BIS OPEX at 1900, it may morph into 2000 depends on what you've got minute by minute i mean geopolitics could blow resistance levels out of the water and force even larger delta hedge future buying which is going to force and the longer this happens the more the physical market will start to rise and cement those levels now andrew my favorite subject of all of course is silver what's going on andrew is the lagging price action does it have anything to do with the bank of america derivative position Shane, I knew that silver question was coming, my friend. It always comes. Um, yeah, good time. Um, good time as Eddie to talk about that because it's been a, certainly it's been the elephant in the room. I think it's, uh, people are questioning this position. But it's important to, to, to really look at, it's not a naked position. So we have to, we have to kind of look at that. Um, look, March, let's just see, March silver, contract, which is the contract, is going to roll over into the May contract on Monday. So we've always got volatility around these uh, when a contract ends and, and a new contract begins. And, and it'll be in first notice day 
uh, when tomorrow when this episode is published. And, and that means that uh, if you have a margin position, you have to fully fund it and fully pay for it, which generally means you're going to either deliver or take delivery of it. Now, let's look at a completely different set of drivers here. Now, it's something we looked at previously, but continues really to, to play out. And that is, we need to look at the blatantly counterintuitive action in silver. People have been questioning, what's going on with silver? How come it's not rising? And it's obviously evidence capping at the prior resistance at 24. Now we're running into 25, but it's obviously they're quickly bringing it back down below 25 today. So bear in mind that, that, um, that this, this resistance at 24, it, this capping drove the ratio trade, which is the balance between the gold and the silver price, to a ludicrous close to 80 to 1, 80 ounces of silver for one, for, for one ounce of gold, which is implausible given the refiner constraints, large premiums, very strong spot index physical demand. I mean, really, we've got orders for size months out before you can get it. So digging into the, the detail, we find the selling not emanating out of the COMEX at all. It emanates from large unallocated foreign exchange spot silver credit positions churning inside this opaque SLV flywheel. Now, connecting the dots into the daily footprints around this COMEX exchange for physical SLV flywheel, this, this, this sort of uh, rigged flywheel, we, we, we also need to weigh up that the December um, OCC, the Office of the Comptroller Derivative Report, which we'll get a new one at the end of this month, but, but essentially uh, at the end of March, but essentially this report separates gold derivatives from the remaining over-the-counter foreign exchange precious metals. And that comprises of silver, platinum, and palladium. Now, given that the OCC bundles this derivative position together, and that the best estimate from what we can discern from liquidity providers is that conservatively around 80% of this position is silver, it gives us a really good idea that the Bank of America silver derivatives position in December was around 640 million ounces. Now, actually, I think it's now being cut to around 400, but it's still massive, but it looks like it's being unwound. Now, spot market footprints tell us that aside from some very uh, short-term algo-generated inversely correlated positions, COMEX specs are not naked sellers short sellers of silver. In fact, any COMEX selling that we've been seeing is largely hedging of some largely unrinsable sticky longs. And looking forward from the appearance of this Bank of America over the OCC derivative position to now, following the, the 2022 dip, which was at 21,411, I remember, and the rise again uh, up and above 24 uh, last week, uh, and now today higher, we estimate this sweet spot was 23.8. That, that's where they wanted this price. That's why we saw this price being capped constantly, no matter what gold was doing, no matter what the supply uh, fundamentals were dictating. This was hugely being capped. And currently, this, this morning, it went up to almost $2 underwater. Now, that's obviously going to cause a lot of pain. So looking at the footprints, what we've now actually been evidencing into this capping on every run in around 24 and now 25 is that the capping is occurring in spot foreign exchange silver, which is directly related to the unallocated SLV credit positions being managed into the end of a large size month uh, OPEX related bets at 23.8. However, the liquidity providers tell me that Citi, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they're all taking the long side of XAG, of, the, of, of foreign exchange silver longs. And we see the Bank of America position untenable after rollover into May contract on Monday. And as you know, it's always been my contention that all the banks hedge COMEX longs or shorts with long or short over-the-counter positions. So technically, the estimated plus 600 million ounces of Bank of America positions, they're not naked short. 
However, the SLV often on ramps are in the form of unallocated silver credit positions. And as we've proved, when BlackRock announced they would not go to market to fill that 1.5 billion ounces of silver back in February 21, it made it clear that a large percentage of SLV baskets comprise of unallocated silver. And given these positions can be lease swapped or short sold, short sold are clearly rehypothecated. It is not rocket science. Now, given the, the, the heavy paper defense at 24, now 25 at these round numbers, we can deduce that the Bank of America position is clearly underwater. Now, we're absolutely sure firsthand through our liquidity providers that, that at least JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs and Standard Charters are very, very long physical silver. And it's possible that therein lays the lessor uh, or the combined lessors of the Bank of America short position. And that's why I say most LPMA first tier bullion banks are long against this Bank, bank of America defense. Now, while not all the OCC reported silver derivative positions are naked, it does provide the, the, the Bank of America position concentration that can be gained. And that is, I think, what's been happening. Look, Shane, in the larger picture, one thing that recent geopolitical escalations have raised the ante on is the prospects of the divide that we've talked about before between the Bank of International Settlements and the US. And we, we think this, this divide is widening. Now, obviously, geopolitics is going to make everyone look like they're sticking together, but I don't believe that's the case. Europe is on a landmass that makes Russia and China that's, that, that Russia and China are neighbors. Every US global action through history, recent history, has backfired on Europe. And I, I took, when I talk to, I talk to people with money who, who are very influential. And this is, this is their view, not just my view, this is their view as well. And, and I think what, what it is, you know, they're seeing that every action has always it's resulted in major kickbacks. The US is insulated from these kickbacks. We're talking about migrant uh, crisis. We're talking about um, uh, energy costs now rising through the roof. Uh, you know, I think I pay 40%, 50% more. I think today uh, gas prices are going up by 20, heating costs go up by another 20% today. A lot of people can't afford that. And, and I think you're finding uh, in, in Germany, for example, uh, has is, is short of energy supply. I mean, so you, you, you're looking at that the fallout is going to hit Europe. And then, you know, you saw um, uh, Biden three weeks ago, I think it was, or two weeks ago, at, at a conference, press conference in Europe, and saying, this, they, you know, if Russia invades, we're going to shut down Nord Stream 2. But then the German reporter said to him, but that's a that's not a European question. You you can't say you're shutting it down. He said, believe me, it will happen. So you 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 know the influence is there. So I think what we do see is that Europe has for really a long time been looking to create its own European uh, military force, and and that's on the table. It's been been looked at multiple times, but that would render render NATO as a relic of the past. And it would reduce U.S. military presence in this region. So I think we also see <laughs> this is the big divide. The Bank of International Settlements wanting to move to revalue gold. Europe values gold. The Fed seeks to defend a rapidly depleting. Uh, you see, the Fed is basically trying to bolster their, their dollar hegemony. But basically have no interest in gold, have absolutely no, uh, it's not even discussed within the Fed. Uh, and we, we remember we had this really good interview um, with uh, Di Martino Booth, and, and she was agreeing that, look, you know, there's, this is clearly a, a divide. So it's interesting. Uh, and I think, so really to kind of wrap things up, bottom line, what are we looking at? We think the current bearish bets churning inside this SLV, GLD, ETFs, they're really wrong-footed, um, clearly after this geopolitical action here. And as we discussed a second ago, 
it's it, all this is while a strong physical market has been actively building higher stair steps and any competing any downside gaps uh, close attempts into the BIS OPEX and we're seeing some downside gap attempts today I think they're going to be attacked very quickly by sovereign as sovereign demand will kick in again and the ramp up in COMEX open interest that people have been mithering about and said well here we go again COMEX open interest has risen yes it can propose a problem because there's a paper element that can be rinsed out but it's also attributable to forced delta hedge futures buying to hedge previous capping efforts at 1850 and 1900. So this futures buying could be forced to accelerate if geopolitics escalate. If we de-escalate, then we could expect 1900 to be retested. So COMEX bets in silver evidence a very sticky long spec position. Now this gaming is occurring SLV as we've discussed, but it's quite clear that the swap dealers, who are the predatory section of the uh, COT report, the, the, the fact that they're maintaining a net long position into an increasingly tapped out capping efforts, as evidenced when we saw 24 capped and 25 capped, looking at the structure, it bodes well that post rollover, we probably will have all the ingredients for a decent rally to unfold. All right, and with that, remember, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They are not the same. Don't be fooled. And that's why you're here learning about physical, physical, physical. There you have it. That's all we have for you. Today, another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. You know, please help us spread the word about this exciting channel by liking, sharing, subscribing, and don't forget to click on that bell notification if you would like to be advised as soon as these episodes go live. And with that, we'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.